years ago on the first Resurrection Sunday. That morning was filled with pandemonium. There were angels descending. There was an earthquake, stone rolled away. Soldiers were fainting, women were crying, and men were panicking. People were running from and to the tomb, trying to understand what had just taken place. And suddenly in the midst of all this pandemonium, an angel steps up and he says, listen, I'm telling you guys, with all your running to and fro, with all that's happening, I'm telling you, someone needs to go tell his disciples. We used his cross, his tomb, and his ascension as a backdrop for our cross, our tomb, and our ascension. And we used his story to set us up to share our testimony of not only what he went through, but what you've gone through. And the angel said, someone needs to go tell them. Here's the takeaway. His death will deal with your guilt, but you must let go of your shame. You have to. Number two, his, re his resurrection will open your tomb, but you must walk out of your grave. You've got to let go of your memories, your regrets, and your past. And then number three, everyone needs to hear your testimony to find their grace. Because Acts chapter 4, verse 33, you remember, the Bible said the apostles, they testified of the power of his resurrection. And when they did, grace fell on everyone. So when we stand and we testify of how he resurrected us, suddenly there's a grace that comes into the room and people say what he did for them, he'll do for me. The message that we preach is a message of good news. The Bible calls it good news. It's good, and trust me, it's news to most people in the church and outside the church. Good news. The word gospel in the Greek, as you know, means a good message. A good message. And after the cross and after the tomb, I want you to know that there's an ascension that awaits you. We don't preach that at Easter. We preach the cross, the tomb, but we stop. But understand to complete that picture, you've got to understand there was a cross, there was a tomb, and there was an ascension. Yes. That's important. The Bible says in Ephesians, he raised us up with Christ, the exalted one, and we ascended with him into the glorious perfection and authority of the heavenly realm, for we are now co-seated as one with Christ. You need to know that his resurrection resulted in your ascension. And that's the good message that we're trying to preach to the world, that Christ wants to elevate your living, that Christ wants to raise you up where we're being transformed and moving from glory to glory to glory. We don't stop at salvation. It's important that sinners become saints, but then saints must become sons. And we have to take our place in the heavenlies at the right hand of the Father and operate in the authority on planet earth that he has given us. So preach the cross, preach the tomb, but don't leave out the ascension. And as the angel said, someone needs to go tell them that there was a cross, there was a tomb, but there's also an ascension. And he wants to resurrect you to a new level of living. Again, repeat after me, someone needs to tell them. If you have your Bibles, go with me to Luke chapter 14. This is a different text than we took last week. Last week, we took it out of Matthew 28, of course. But today we're going to go to Luke 14, verses 15 through 24. 
reading in the Passion. I'm going to read quickly. Verse 15, when they heard this. Now, I want you to notice that. That's important because when you read words like that, you need to stop and ask the question, what is it they, what is it they heard? When they heard this, we'll speak more on that in just a moment. When they heard this, one of the dinner guests said to Jesus, someday God will have a kingdom feast and how happy, and notice this, privileged will be the ones who get to share in that joy. So Jesus has been speaking to this group of people. They're having Sunday dinner and he's speaking to them. And after he finished speaking, this guy, after hearing this said, hey, wow, how privileged we as the Jews will be one day to sit at his table. Individual as religious leaders and national pride. And in response to their privileged attitude, Jesus in verse 16 told them a parable. There was a man who invited many to join him in a great feast. When the day for the feast arrived, the host instructed his servants to notify all the invited guests the Jewish nation, and tell them, come, for everything is not ready for you. But one by one, they all made excuses. One said, I can't, I just, brought, I just bought some property, I'm obligated to go and look it over. Another said, uh, accept my regrets, I just purchased five teams of oxen, I need to make sure they can pull the plow. And another one said, I just got uh, married, so I need to go take care of this. Verse 21. The servant reported back to the host and told him of all their excuses. So the master became angry and said to the servant, go at once throughout the city, invite everyone you find, the poor, the blind, the disabled, the hurting, the lonely, and invite them to my banquet. When the servant returned to his master, he said, sir, I've done what you asked, and yet there's still room. So the master told him, all right, go out again. This time bring back uh, all that you can. Persuade the beggars, the outcasts, the homeless, urgently insist that they come in and enjoy the feast so that they, so that my house may be full. Verse 24. So I say to you all, the one who receives an invitation to feast with me and makes excuses will never enjoy my banquet. I want you to go back and notice verse 15. When he heard this, he said, we're privileged. Let's title this, Who Will Tell Them, Part 2. Father, bless the reading of your word. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Let me communicate the heart of God, what you've dropped in my spirit for two weeks now. Let me get this out to your people. We pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Sunday dinner with Jesus. Wow, how cool was that? Luke 14, 15, when he heard this, he said, how happy we will be as the privileged. This group of Jews believed that the Messiah would set up a worldly kingdom and that they would join with him in ruling over all other nations. This assumption led to their sense of both individual and national pride when they heard this. What did they hear? They heard some stories he told in verses 1 through 14. And then in verse 15, he said, when he heard this. And in response to this privilege, Jesus told them a parable. He did this because he wanted them to hear and understand the three things he had just told them. So try to picture this. It's Sunday dinner. They've gathered around the table. They're sitting on the floor. Their tables were very low. They sat on the floor with pillows to recline on. And they're sitting there and Jesus tells them three things. And then this one religious leader speaks up and he said, wow, that was powerful. Ha, you know, wow, such a privilege for us as religious leaders and as Jews to rule one day over the nations of the earth. And Jesus looked at him and he's thinking, you didn't hear a thing I just said. And so he tells them this parable. And I just want to go through here real quick and pull out three things verses 1 through 14, and share that with you. And then I'm going to pray with you. Three things Jesus shared. Number one, there was a question of healing on the Sabbath and compassion. Say compassion. Verses 1 through 3 on the screen. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body, 
Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Understand, and looking at this prominent Pharisee, that his prominent religious position prevented him from seeing human suffering. There was a man swollen, standing in front of Jesus, and this prominent religious leader never saw the man. All he could do was watch Jesus. He was watching Jesus, keeping an eye on what he was saying and what he was going to do. Religion will keep an eye on you. They wanted to make sure that he behaved himself. Religion will always try to put limits and restrictions on you. They wanted Jesus to behave. And so this prominent religious leader kept an eye on him. But his position of privilege blinded him to the human suffering that was standing directly in front of him. And therein lies the danger for you and I. I've been in church all my life. I know how to do church. And the sad thing is, is that we're so good at it now that we can really do it without the help of Holy Spirit. We really don't have to have the anointing. Now the anointing makes the difference and it breaks the yoke, but we're pretty good at what we do now. And the fact is, in our positions of religious prominence, it's so easy for us to overlook humanity and all of its suffering that could be standing directly in front of us. They never saw. Do you understand what that feels like? To be in a group, in a room that's filled with religious leaders and yet no one sees you. Do you understand? There are people in this room and watching online. I know you identify with that because you come to church week after week after week and you slip in and you slip out and you feel that in all of our religious uh, uh, prominence and our, our positions, somehow religion just looks past you. It's like the homeless community in our cities. They say, we feel that you don't see us. We feel that you look just through us. We feel that you don't know what to do with us, so you ignore us. And we have the homeless but it's in the church. They move from church to church, never really getting rooted into a church body because they just feel that people look past them. You see, it's easy. It's easy to get caught up in the program. It's easy to get caught up in what we do, that we look straight past the human suffering that is in our midst. You see, Matthew 4 said, Jesus went through Galilee Teaching, preaching, and healing people. That's what he did. Jesus' blueprint for a miracle service. How many wants the blueprint? How many would like to have a miracle service? I got one for you. Teach the truth, proclaim good news, and then heal the people. You see, the first step in their miracle is me telling them the truth concerning his goodness. And that's what people need. The gospel a good message. They need to know that their father loves them. They need to know that their father cares. They need to know that we care. That's why this year I keep saying to you, God is gooder than our religion will allow us to believe. We just can't believe it. We just can't get there. He's gooder than what we think. He's gooder than what we're preaching. He's gooder. Now I'm not talking about compromise. Don't even go there. We still take a righteous position, but a righteous position is doing the right thing at the right time for the right person. It's time for the church to have a new revelation that God is good and he's gooder than what my religion will allow me to believe. And we need to preach that message because when I teach the truth and I preach the goodness, then I can lay hands on the sick and they will get healed. Understand God is bigger God is bigger than what we're preaching. I'm telling you, he's bigger than what we're preaching. And we can't be afraid. You can't preach him too big. There was a question of healing on the Sabbath. And he asked those religious preachers, is it okay to heal on the Sabbath? Why would you even need to ask that question? But you see, our religion keeps us from believing 
in the goodness of God. Yes. Number two, he talks to them. And it's a question of seating arrangements and importance. Say importance. Verse 7 and 11. He went on to tell a story to the guest around the table, noticing how each had tried to elbow into the place of honor. He said, if you walk around with your nose in the air, you're going to fall flat on your face. But if you're content to be simply yourself, you will become more than yourself. Here's a fact for you. Man may become too big for God to use, but no one is ever too small. We said it last Sunday, super spiritual people don't inspire, they intimidate because they don't tell the whole story. They don't tell it. They don't tell everything. They walk around with their nose in the air and they fall flat on their face. You can get too big for God. I told you the story. It's, it's a powerful story because it was so real for me. I was, Suzanne and I had just been on the, the, the evangelistic road field for about a year. And uh, I was in um, the panhandle of Florida preaching for a man uh, by the name of Pastor Moore at Carmel Assembly of God. And this first night, we had a powerful move of God. In fact, I didn't even preach. And it was just a great service. And the next night, I remember walking out on the stage and taking the pulpit, and there was a sense of pride in me as a young preacher of the kind of service we had the night before. And I looked down at my notes and I had a physical experience where I felt Holy Spirit walk off the platform and he said, you've got it. You can get too big where God can't use you. But no one is ever too small. No one is ever too small. He could even take a small child and use a child to make a point. No one is ever too small. He can take a widow woman. He can take a woman caught in adultery. He can take people, ordinary people to do extraordinary things. No one is ever too small. So never seek glory or honor at the expense of other people. They were elbowing their way in around the table. Don't ever do that. Looking at this story, your greatest anointing is discovered and your deepest identity. He said to these guys, look, be content with yourself. Know who you are in Christ Jesus. Your greatest anointing is discovered in your deepest identity. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I know that full well. Listen, when you understand who you are in Christ Jesus, when you understand your uniqueness and how that you don't have to compare yourself with others, you, when you know that you can celebrate your individuality and stand up and be who you are, God can use you like no other time. I don't have to be like other preachers. I don't have to be conformed to their style or their image. I can just be who God called me to be. That's why for years, since 2010, I keep telling you, when you do what you do the way you do it, you're dangerous. When you do what you do, the way you do it, the way you do it, that's why fine arts for me has always been so important because these young people get into a small room, crammed with people, with people just a few feet in front of them and they have to stand there flat-footed, flat-footed and just in front of God and everybody and they've got to just do their thing. And I look at them and I say, you go girl, you go. Do your thing the way you do it and watch what God can do. Saul tried to load David up with his armor. He shook it off and said, this don't fit me. This is not who I am. And with a rag and five rocks, he went out there and took the head off of the giant. You can kill your giants when you shake off the opinions of others and their expectations and you just be who you are and strut your stuff for Jesus and stand up with a rag and a rock and watch what God will do. Yeah. Ah. Learn to be content 
with where he starts you and with where you will finish. He said to them, be content with who you are and know that when you're simply yourself, he said, you can become more. He's saying, if you'll stop trying to be other people and be yourself, I'll work with you because I got a plan for you. Do you understand that there is, how many believes that the footsteps of a righteous man are ordered to the Lord? How many believes that a man will make his plans but God determines his steps? So that means that if I stay on my path, if I'm in my lane, that God will help me to become more in Christ Jesus. To go from one talent, two talent, five talents, I can grow. How many wants to grow and be everything that God's called you to be? But you gotta stay in your lane. But when you get outside your lane, you're gonna miss your destiny. You've got to stay where God's called you. Be who God's called you to be. You can't be someone else. You gotta be the man or the woman that God's called you to be. But when you are content by simply being yourself, he said, I can work with that. And in fact, there's more to you than what we see. You're bigger on the inside than what we see on the outside. There's more to you. He's telling these guests, there's more to you than what we see. So just simply be yourself and know that there's more that's coming. So here we go, guys. Listen, you've got to learn to be content with who you are, with where you start and where you're gonna finish. Some of you are never going to be the president of the United States. Some of you are never going to play professional baseball. Now that, I know that's devastating for some of you, but you're never gonna get there. Some of you are never going to get to that stage that you have in your mind. But if you'll just simply accept who you are, who you're not. If you'll just simply accept where you are. The Bible talks about one talent, two talent, and five talent. You can grieve all day long that you're not a five talent person. Or you can accept the fact that you're a one or a two, but you can work hard and you can double your talents. You can double it. I've always been okay with accepting who I am but I won't stay where I'm at. I'm gonna work hard and double what I got. I'm gonna preach my heart out. I'm gonna work, I'm gonna work as long and as hard as I can. I may not be a five talent guy, but just, you just hang on, I'm coming. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm working hard. I've told you the story of a self-made millionaire in Austin that invested in my church from time to time. He bankrupt five times. He said, preacher, let me tell you something. I'm not the smartest in the town, but I'll outwork my competitors. I won't quit and I won't give up. And about the fifth time he started a business, he became wealthy because he just wouldn't back off. Listen, guys, you've got to understand who you are, who you're not, and stay in your lane and know that God's got a plan and you can become everything that he's called you to be. Number three. It was a question of hospitality and motivation. Say motivation. Motivation. Ah, Verses 12, 14. The next time you put on a dinner, he told the host, Don't just invite the kind of people who will return the favor. Invite the misfits from the wrong side of the tracks. They won't be able to return the favor, but the favor will be returned at the resurrection. Did you know that God loves people not for what they can do, but for who they are? And so should the church. 1 Corinthians 4, we're the Messiah's misfits. You got to love that. Uh, is there any misfits in the room? Or it, it, it just, it, you've got to love this. We're the, mis- you ought to get a t-shirt. I'm a Messiah misfit. <laughs> Messiah's misfits. You might be sure of yourselves, but Paul said, we live in the midst of frailties and uncertainties. You might be well thought of by others, but we're mostly kicked around. This is Paul speaking. Misfits. We're the Messiah misfits. It's like the dirty dozen. It's like David's men that were in debt, desperados and desperate. And the Bible says he gathered all those kind of men up around David. 
That was the kind of men he had. It wasn't the pretty boys of the community. It was those that were down and dirty. They had scars. They were missing teeth. They were, they were, they were bloody men. Well, I want to tell you something. If I'm going to go in a fight, I want some David, David's mighty men around me. I, I want some guys that have been in a few fights. How about you? I, I want some guys that got some scars. How about you? I want some guys that have been to hell and back, and they'll come around me and say, let's get this done. I want some scrappers. Am I making sense? Is there any scrappers? I don't, you see, I believe the church world today has come, become way too passive, and you can die in your passivity, and we're way, 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 way too sanitized. We're so clean on Sunday that the misfits can't even understand us. Uh, now, don't go way too far with that. Be careful with that. The misfits, the Messiah misfits, David's mighty men who gathered around him. But here's the thing. God uses misfits for his most important missions. If God has got a giant to kill, he's going to send that David. Listen, he fought the bear. He fought the lion. And he said, I can take this guy on. Don't worry about it. I got this. Listen, that's what God is looking for. Misfits. People that maybe don't fit in the world but yet they don't fit in the church. It's like Isaiah who said, I've seen the Lord and now I'm all undone. I'm unraveled. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go because the world doesn't want me and the church doesn't understand me. Well, welcome, you're a Messiah misfit. You see, that's been my problem all my ministry. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm too Pentecostal for some, okay? And not enough for others. It's like, I'm too much for them and not enough for those. I, a misfit, a misfit. Just don't fit in. Go to meetings. I, I, I go to meetings. Suzanne and I have been to a lot of meetings with preachers and, and sit out there and just feel like a misfit. Sit out there and have them call out perhaps my home church and make a reference to it. Sit there and talk about it. And I'm sitting out there and they know I'm out there. Listen, you got to understand. You have to understand that, that God is looking for men and women that are, not, that are not afraid to not fit in like Jesus, to step out, to step out. The world didn't want him and the church didn't understand him. To step out and to be who God called you to be the way God called you to be it. Now I'm going somewhere, it's just hold on. Psalms 139, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. You need to know this full well. God made you different for a reason. Discover the reason and understand your purpose in life. Understand why you are the way you are. Those that are willing to serve the least are the ones God can use the most. It was a question of hospitality and motivation. So you see, Jesus is at dinner and he's talking to all these religious leaders. And he said, listen, I want to talk to you about compassion. You see this guy standing right here? He swelled up. He swelled up with fluid. He's in trouble. He's suffering. Is it okay if I heal him? Compassion. And then he went into second point and says, look, when you guys come around the table, you try to your seating arrangements. Don't elbow for honor and glory and position. And don't, don't elbow, you know, at the expense of other people. You know, promote yourself and promote your ministry at the expense of other people. Because you can become too big for God to use, but you can never be too small. Importance. Importance. And then number three, he spoke here about motivation. What motivates you to do what you do? Hospitality. Invite the people that others won't invite. Invite the misfits. Why do we do what we do? Do we really want people coming to church here? And I mean, across the spectrum. Do we want all of them? Every bit of them? Even the ones that don't always smell right? Even the ones that have luggage? Even the ones that have, 
had some problems. Do we really want, I'm not being sarcastic. I'm, I'm just, I'm searching my heart. I hope you're searching yours. Who do we want to come into our church? You see, Jesus had Sunday dinner. And at this Sunday dinner, he told them, God is good. You're important to him. And God uses misfits. Oh. And this is the gospel, the good message. And the angel said, someone needs to go tell them. Repeat it after me. Someone needs to go tell them. That it's good news. God is good. And you're important to him. I'm important to him. Yes, you are. But you don't know what I've done, pastor. I understand. But you don't know where I've been. I get it. You don't know my background and my story. I got it. You don't know the luggage I have that I need to unpack. I get it. But let me just tell you the third thing. God uses misfits for his most important missions. Think about that. And when you turn your story into a testimony, it releases grace on other people's lives. The grace of God. <laughs> Luke 14, verse 15. This prominent religious leader, when he heard this, he said, how privileged we are. And Jesus responds to their assumption of privilege. How? With a parable about misfits. Stephen, come help me. You have to understand that in our text, Luke 14, verses 15 through 24, and this parable he talks about an invitation going out for this banquet, an invitation. He said in verse 16, there was a man who invited many people. You see, it was the custom at this time to give a first invitation to a banquet. And then when the food was ready, to send out a second call, the Greek word, Come means continual coming. So the host of the banquet would prepare everything. And when it was all ready, he'd get his servants to say, now, go get the guest. And they would come out and say, come on, come on, no, come on, come. No, 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 you need to come. Come now. It's ready. Yeah, yeah but I'm, no, come now. And you heard the three excuses that were given. One talked about, business one talked about uh, his uh, his schedule and then one talked about pleasure and that's where we are today in America we have excuses and we send regrets it's regrettable it's regrettable but I've got my business I I've got a busy schedule or we're caught up in pleasures, excuses. And so the master of the house told his servants, okay, go out and get the misfits and tell them to come. Those that don't have a business to worry about, those that they don't have a schedule, they don't have one. And those that aren't worried about pleasure, they're worried about survival. Go get them and let them fill the seats. When I read this again, it just, you know what rattled my cage? Is I don't want someone taking my seat. Oh no. Not, I don't want, 
I don't want the mantle going to someone else. I don't want to get like Elisha who gets overwhelmed with depression. And it wasn't that God gave up on Elisha. Elisha gave up on God. And so he said, okay, son, you're done. Take your mantle and give it to somebody else. I don't want that. I don't want to miss my opportunities. Yes. Steve Hill in the Brownsville Revival used to say that all the time. Take advantage of the opportunity of a, of a lifetime and the lifetime of the opportunity. And he give an altar call. And that's where we are today. We've come to the parable of the great supper and he's calling us. Not only as sinners to be saints, but saints to become sons. He's calling us. And, and it's time to time to cut out the excuses. I, 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 I'll serve him when I do this, or I'm going to start serving God when this happens, or I'm going to get serious for Jesus when I, no, you need to cut that out. You, you need to cut that out. So look at what was in this. I got four minutes. You, you, can you, is your cup runneth over? Can you handle it? Hang in there. Take a deep breath. Four things in four minutes, three things in four minutes. The parable of the great supper Number one, conviction is God's invitation to salvation. Verse 17, come, for everything is now ready for you. Come, come right now. I, I've got to go check on my land. No, you don't. I got to go check on my oxen. No, you don't. I got to go on my honeymoon. No, you don't. Come right now. Right now. You have to remember prevenient grace. We preached on this years ago. We don't talk about it. It's theology. Prevenient grace. Prevenient grace is the teaching that before a man can seek God, God must first have sought the man. You see, we always talk about, I found God. No, God found you. Yes. Do you understand you can't come to him except he draw you? No man can come to the Father except he be drawn. That's the teaching of Jesus. That's why we like to take that scripture and said, God's spirit will not always strive with a man. You need to understand how dangerous it is to come under the conviction of Holy Spirit, either for salvation or to deal with sin in your life or to answer the call. And right now, I feel the anointing. God's talking to somebody. God's talking. Somebody's getting it. He's up in your grill. And you need to listen to him right now because prevenient grace simply means that God must first draw you before you can come to him. So anytime God puts conviction on your life, that is an act of grace. Yes. Yes. And you don't need just to shrug that off. It's dangerous. Number two, in the parable, today is your day of salvation. Verse 18, but one by one, they all made excuses, business schedule and pleasure. You know what the, what the word excuses there means in the Greek? To depreciate, to devalue the moment. When you take and shrug off Holy Spirit conviction, you devalue who he is and what he does. To, to depreciate the moment. Don't, don't depreciate Moments like this in services where Holy Spirit is moving. Don't do it. Don't do that. That's why during the Brownsville revival, Steve would give that call and we'd watch hundreds as they would rush to the altars and fall prostrate before God because conviction had fell in the room and sinners were crying out, what must I do to be saved? Don't shrug that off. It's a dangerous thing. Be careful with that. When he moves on you, when the angels dip their wings and stir the water, get in. You say, well, what people think? Who cares? The people don't care about you anyway. Get in. Don't depreciate. Did you know that procrastination is the thief of time? Moment after moment, it steals until all is lost. Elisha. What are you doing here, son? Well, I'm the only one left. Son, what are you doing here? They don't care about me. Son, I'm asking you, what are you doing here? I'm just discouraged. Okay. Go give your mantle to somebody else. You need to make sure that somebody doesn't take your seat. Make sure. 
tell my servants to go out and say, come, come, come. They won't come. Go get the misfits. Somebody that doesn't care what people think, that doesn't care, doesn't care how it looks. They came in that banquet hall with all their stinky nastiness, with all their past, all their junk, all their luggage. They came in there and the Father's house was full with the Messiah's misfits. Number three, in the parable, God is more willing to save sinners than sinners are to be saved. God is more determined to reach the lost than the lost is to be found. That's important. Verse 23, urgently insist, he told his servants, that they come in and enjoy the feast so that my house may be full. Urgently insist. Do you understand that we must live with a sense of urgency? We got to quit being so so passive and just we got to quit all that listen time is slipping away procrastination is the thief of time and it's taken moment by moment by moment next sunday i'm going to make this right next sunday i'm going to go to that altar next sunday i'm going to come under pastor's oversight and get plugged in the church and volunteer next sunday next sunday next sunday until eventually i'm standing over your casket and i'm reading your obituary because you ran out of moments. To those of you online, I love you, but it's time for you to come back. It's time. It's time. It's time. There are people that because of the pandemic fell out of church, wrong word, that, that was distancing themselves because of underlying health issues and their age, and I respect that. But there was another group that just got out of the habit of going to church and they just haven't found their way back. You need to find your way back. You you need to find your way back. It's time. We must live with a sense of urgency. August the 3rd, 1975 is when I was born again, about nine o'clock on a Sunday night at 2630 South 11th Street here in Beaumont. That same year, Andre Crouch came out with a song titled, Tell Them, Tell Them. Listen to the lyrics. Tell them, even if they don't believe you, just tell them. Even if they don't receive you, oh, tell them for me. Tell them for me, please, please tell them for me. Tell them that I love them And I came to let them know, tell them. When it seems you're forsaken, just tell them. Though it seems you're earthly shaken, oh, tell them for me, tell them for me, please. Please tell them for me. Tell them that I love them and I came to let them know. Tell that lonely man who walks the cold streets all alone. Tell that crying child who doesn't have a home. Tell those hungry people dying and lost in the desert, they don't even know that I care, tell them for me, please. Tell them that I love them. Oh, just tell them on the streets and on the highways and tell them and even on the byways, tell them I can mend the broken heart. I can restore the ones who have parted. I came to let them know, I came to let them know, I came to let them know they must know. Tell them, tell them. Tell them that I'm a good God. Tell them that they're important to me. And oh, by the way, tell them, (sighs) often I use misfits to do my most important missions. Yeah, I want the misfits, every one of them. You see, on that Easter, pandemonium, chaos, confusion, fear, angels descending, soldiers fainting, women crying, men panicking, people running to and fro. The angels stepped on and go, hey, listen, I'm telling you, someone 
needs to go tell them about his story and your testimony. Someone needs to tell them about the Father.